السلام علیکم می پیس بی آن یو آل آنریبل جسٹس قاضی ریسپیکٹڈ ایلڈرز ڈسٹنگوش گیس ممبرز آف دی پریس فرینڈس برادرز اینڈ سسٹرز دیر آر مینی سوشل ٹراماز پرابلمز اینڈ کانفلکس وومین ان سوسائٹی فیس ٹو ڈے اینڈ وی سنسیئرلی need to find viable, holistic and humanistic solutions to them. In this context, the subject of women's right is of much contemporary analytical relevance and human interest. A reason enough for all of us to have gathered here today in spite of options of other preoccupations. On behalf of the Islamic Research Foundation, I, Dr. Muhammad Naik, the coordinator for the program today welcome you all with earnest pleasure and sincere appreciation from the heart. We begin today's program formally with the Kirat by Brother Muhammad Ashrafi which will be followed by the reading of its English translation. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم يا خلقكم من نفس واحدة وخلق منها زوجها وبث منهما رجالا كثيرا ونساء واتقوا الله الذي تصالون به والأرحام إن الله كان عليكم رقيبا وآتوا اليتامى تبدلوا الخبيث بالطيب ولا تأكلوا أموالهم ولا تأكلوا أموالهم إلى أموالكم إنه كان حوبا كبيرا صدق الله العظيم. The translation. I seek refuge with Allah from Satan the accursed. In the name of Allah, most gracious, most merciful. O humankind, 
reverence your guardian Lord who created you from a single person, created of like nature his mate, and from them twain scattered like seeds, countless men and women. Reverence God through whom you demand your mutual rights and reverence the wombs that bore you, for God ever watches over you. To orphans restore their property when they reach their age, nor substitute your worthless things for their good ones, and devour not their substance by mixing it up with your own, for this is indeed a great sin. Verily, Allah speaks the truth. Thank you, Brother Ashraf. For those who may be introduced new to the IRF and its activities, I would like to briefly outline the IRF and its work. The IRF was initially started in February 1991 to cater to the need for proper Islamic knowledge amongst the educated Muslim youth. Youth who may be is ignorant about Islamic teachings, youth who may tend to be wrongly apologetic about Islam, and youth who may not know how to properly present and practice Islam for the whole world at large to appreciate and look up to. Now the IRF has been growing in many other deserving areas of its other objectives, especially in humanitarian relief activities and educational upliftment. Amongst its popular services, IRF has a collection of more than 1,300 video cassettes and more than 4,000 audio cassettes on Islam and comparative religion available for free hire in Bombay. It also has, to its credit, more than 50 publications on Islam and comparative religion which are available free on request all over India. To promote education, the need of the day amongst our people, the IRF Educational Trust was established one and a half year back, of which Dr. Zakir happens to be the chairman. Today, Dr. Zakir will be speaking on the topic, Women's Right in Islam, Modernizing or outdated. This will be followed by a question and answer session in which you all have a right to question and cross-examine him on the topic and the matter presented in a very open format. When we consider the rights and justice for women in this open court of ours today, in context of Islamic laws, and views, it is very befitting and our esteemed pleasure to have amongst us the eminent judge, Honorable Justice Muhammad Mujibuddin Qazi to preside over this program. Justice Qazi has been for 13 years from 1968 to 1981 the government leader at the Nagpur bench of the Bombay High Court being the highest law officer of the government of Maharashtra thereof. Then, Justice Qazi became the first Muslim after Justice M. Chagla to be elevated from the bar to the bench as a judge of the Bombay High Court where he has been delivering judgment from 1981 till 1992. On the eve of his retirement in 1992, a very leading newspaper of Central India, the Hitwada, had this to say about him. Justice Kazi belongs to the fast vanishing breed of gentlemen judges. Justice Kazi is at present a member of the Minorities Commission and earlier has been a member of the advisory board, Islamic and Comparative Law Journal in New Delhi. After his retirement as a High Court judge, Justice Kazi has been fortunate and been honored with the elevation to the position of chairman 
Maharashtra Administrative Tribunal, a post equal to that of the rank of the Chief Justice of the Bombay High Court. This high power tribunal is the substitute and bifurcation of the Bombay High Court for all government service matters. To top it all, his humble demeanor and manners, as well as a deep anguish and care for real human progress, make him, make him an apt personality to, proceed, uh, to preside over today's proceedings. He would be introducing the importance and significance of the topic for the day, as well as introduce Dr. Zakir Naik, who he is well acquainted with. Brothers and sisters, Justice M. M. Kazi. The distinguished speaker, Dr. Zakir Naik, Dr. Mohammad Naik, former governor and ambassador Mr. Talay Khan, the foreign dignitaries, ladies and gentlemen. At the outset, I would like to thank the organizers of Islamic Research Foundation for having invited me to preside over this function. I would also like to thank Dr. Mohammad Naik for having said few good words about me. As you are already aware, the subject of the talk this morning is Women's Rights in Islam, Modernizing or Outdated. Modernizing means something which is not antiquated, but in the context of the subject it would mean the rights given to women in Islam 14 centuries back are relevant even today. The debate on the position of women in social spectrum has been going on since centuries. But of late, it has assumed somewhat alarming proportion in certain matters. Issues such as talaq, polygamy, participation of Muslim women in socio-political activities are subject of regular comment and discussion in the media. There may have been problems but at the same time it is a fact that some of the issues were overplayed by the media. No doubt the Western woman has today obtained socio-economic and legal political rights through hectic struggle which was carried on for over 200 years. But friends, I would like to tell you that in the struggle, in the process, she has lost everything. She has lost, if you have closely observed the Western society, you will agree with me that she has lost her family life. She has lost peace of mind. She has lost even her honor and womanhood. On the contrary, Islam has given, has bestowed on women innumerable rights 14 centuries back when contemporary civilizations were still considering whether women could be regarded as a human being. We have therefore to examine objectively, dispassionately and coolly whether the rights so given in Islam are really adequate and therefore 
relevant even today. We are fortunate to have an eminent speaker, Dr. Zakir Naik, who is going to deal with the subject exhaustively. And therefore it is not necessary for me to refer to all those verses in the Holy Quran and the number of traditions of the Holy of the Prophet of Islam pertaining to the rights of human. However, I'll refer to the two verses in order to demonstrate that woman has been given a dignified position in Islam. Verse number 228, Chapter 2, Surah Bakra, as translated by Abdullah Yusuf Ali, whose work is supposed to be the most standard work, reads as under. And women shall have rights similar to the rights against them according to what is equitable, but men have a degree of advantage over them. I would like you to bear in mind every word of this verse. It has unequivocally been declared that men and women have similar rights against each other. These words, this part of the verse has nowhere been diluted anywhere in the Quran. However, the verse further says that men have a degree of advantage over women. It is really these words which we have to be, we have to be sure about because it is here that most of the people have faltered and even some of the commentators have misconceived these words. But at the outset I would like to tell you that these words have nothing to do with the rights between the parties. Rights as I have already, we have already seen just now, have been unequivocally declared in the earlier portion of this verse that men and women have similar rights against each other. In order to fully appreciate this verse, these words, namely that men have a degree of advantage over, over women, we will have to refer also to another verse, verse number 34, chapter 4, Surah Nisa. It reads, its translation reads as under, men are the protectors and maintainers of women because Allah has given the one more into bracket strength, bracket close, than the other, and because they support them from their means. This verse, verse again lays down that men are the protectors and maintainers of women. It further says that God has given one more than the other. Admittedly, woman is a weaker sex, and she has got to be given a special protection in certain matters. Anthropologically, man is stronger and also different, which is also a biological truth. No doubt, nature has given him this advantage for which no credit goes to man and no discredit to woman on that account. But I would like to tell you that this advantage has also been given to men in order so that he is, uh, he is able to effectively discharge his functions. Onerous task has been cast on him, that of a protector and maintainer. And therefore, this advantage which has been given to him has nothing to do with the rights, as I have already said earlier. In fact, this advantage in no way reduces the rights of woman nor her importance. Therefore, the real question that would arise would be, I would request you to ponder over 
and think about the state of affair in the social setup today according to me this is one of the most important and delicate function of the men to give protection to women it is in a very you say in a very deep sense which has to be understood it is not only an ordinary protection in the sense of saving one's life please try to understand and appreciate i would request you to think over whether men are discharging their functions and if you closely examine i have no doubt you will come to this conclusion that 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 men have abdicated their most important function that of giving protection to women and therefore have neglected their their elementary duty i don't want to enter into a dialogue or a debate at this time because there is no time at my at my disposal as to who is responsible for bringing about this tragic situation maybe that woman may, may have also been responsible for this bringing about this situation but the fact remains that this has exposed women to forces of crime and oppression leading to widespread cases of violation of her honor and dignity in the backdrop of indian ethos which has sanctified womanhood no woman would like to bargain for such liberty and no man would like to give up his agree to give up his role as a protector this extremely delicate aspect of relationship between man and woman has been explained by one of the great thinker and the and poet dr akbar in a poem titled women's protection of course the poem is in urdu it it consists of three couplets but i'll translate them these three couplets there after i have recited these three couplets akbar says ek zinda haqeeqat mere seene mein hai mastoor ek zinda haqeeqat mere seene mein hai mastoor kya janega wo jiski ragu mein hai lahu sard kya janega wo jiski ragu mein hai lahu sard na apna parda na taaleem nahi ho ke purani nisfaniyat e zan ka nighe baaye faqat mar जिस कौम ने जिंदा हकीकत जिस कौम ने जिंदा हकीकत को न पाया तो उस कौम का खुर्शीद बहुत जल्द हुआ जर्द द ट्रांसलेशन वुड बी दैट जिस कौम ने जिंदा हकीकत को न पाया द नेशन विच हैज नॉट रियलाइज दिस ट्रूथ सॉरी एक जिंदा हकीकत मेरे सीने में है मस्तूर अ लिविंग ट्रूथ लाइज डीप इन टू माई हार्ट क्या समझेगा वो जिसकी रगो में है लहू सर इट इज नॉट फॉर दोस्त सेंसेज आर फ्रोजन ने पर्दा ना तालीम नहीं हो के पुरानी इट इज नीदर वेल नॉर एजुकेशन न्यू आर ओल्ड निस्वानियत जन का निगह बाए फकत मर्द द प्रोटेक्टर ऑफ द डिग्निटी ऑफ वूमन इज मैन अलोन जिस कौम ने जिंदा हकीकत को न पाया अ नेशन विच हैज नॉट डिस्कवर दिस दिस ट्रूथ उस कौम का खुर्शीद बहुत जल्द हुआ जल्द its sun is bound to fade away friends as i have already said that ex- i have a extremely limited time at my disposal and the dr zakir is already there who is going to deal with the subject exhaustively exhaustively sufficient it suffice i uh, nonetheless i would like to tell you that woman has been given a very dignified position in quran and the real problem is only one of our own ignorance of quran's real spirit therefore the real solution would be to educate and enlighten the people may remind you on at this moment the great words of thomas jefferson that a nation which ex- which expects to be ignorant and also free it expects what never was and never will be wo mauzis the zamane mein musalman hokar और तुम ख्वार पिए तारीख पूरा होकर लेडीज एंड जेंटलमैन वी हैव अमिस्टस बॉम्बेज 
यंग बट ब्रिलियंट एंड इरुडाइट स्पीकर डॉक्टर जाकिर नाइक दो ही इज ए डॉक्टर बाय प्रोफेशन बट ही एज डेडिकेटेड हिमसेल्फ टू दी काज ऑफ प्रोफेगेश प्रोफेगेशन ऑफ इस्लाम इन इन इट्स राइट परस्पेक्टिव इज फाउंडर जनरल सेक्रेटरी ऑफ Islamic Research Foundation which was established in 1991 he is he has widely traveled within and outside country and has delivered number of lectures at such a young age he has developed deep insight into Quran which reminds us what Tagore has said that a lamp cannot light another lamp unless it continues to burn its own flame it would be most unfair if on this occasion i ignore i don't mention the distinguished parents of the, of dr zakir naik but for whose guidance and blessings he would not have been what he is today i once again thank you very much thank you very much the talk by dr zakir naik on today's topic dr zakir naik a'udhu billahi minash shaitanir rajeem bismillahir rahmanir rahim innal muslimina wal muslimati wal mu'minina wal mu'minati wal qanitina wal qanitati was sadiqina was sadiqati was sabirina was sabirati wal khashiina wal khashiyati والمتصدقين والمتصدقات والصائمين والصائمات والحافظين فروجهم والحافظات والذاكرين الله كثيرا والذاكرات اراد الله لهم مغفرة واجرا عظيما بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي امري واحلل عقدة من لساني يفقهوا قولي honorable justice mm kazi respected elders and my dear brothers and sisters i welcome all of you with the islamic greetings assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh meaning may peace blessings and mercy of almighty allah be on all of you the topic for today's day is the women's rights in islam modernizing or outdated According to the Oxford Dictionary, women's rights are the rights that promote a position of social and legal equality of women to men. According to the Oxford Dictionary, they are the rights claimed for the women <coughs> equal to those of men as regards to suffrage, that's the right to vote. as regards to property etc modernizing according to the oxford dictionary means to make modern to adapt to modern needs or habits and according to the oxford dictionary it means to make modern or to give a new character or appearance example to modernize one's ideas in short modernizing is a process of updating or opting for the betterment of the present status itself it is not the present modern status itself can we modernize ourselves to master our problems and to realize a new way of life for the whole human race i am not concerned about the modern ideas the conclusions and the categorical statements made by scientists and unexperienced armchair experts as how a life should be lived by a woman i am going to base my conclusions and considerations on truth which can be proved by experience experience and unbiased factual holistic analysis are the shortest between the gold of truth and the glitter of theory we have to check our thinking against reality otherwise many a times our mental process will go astray indeed 
the great brains of one time believed that the world was flat. If we agree with the women's rights in Islam as portrayed by the Western media, you have no option but to agree that the women's rights in Islam are outdated. The Western talk of women's liberation is actually a disguised form of exploitation of a body, deprivation of honor, and degradation of a soul. The Western society, which speaks of upgrading the status of women in Islam, have actually reduced her status to concubines, to mistresses, to society parasites, which are mere tools in the hands of sex marketeers and pleasure seekers, which are disguised behind the colorful screen of art and culture. Islam's radical revolutionary support gave women their due rights and status in the days of the ignorance 1400 years ago. Islam's objective was and continues to be to modernize our thinking, our living, our seeing, our hearing, our feeling and striving for the women's upliftment and emancipation in the society. Before I dwell further into the topic, I would like you to make note of a few points. The first point is that approximately one-fifth of the world's population consists of Muslim. There are different Muslim societies. Some may be close to Islam, some may be far away from Islam. The women's rights in Islam should be judged according to the authentic sources and not what individual Muslims do or what the Muslim society does. The authentic sources of Islam are the Quran, which is the word of God, and the authentic Sunnah and the tradition of our beloved Prophet, may peace be upon him. Point number four. The Quran will never contradict itself, nor will the Sahih Hadith contradict itself. Neither will these two authentic sources contradict each other. Point number five. Sometimes the scholars differ, and many times these differences can be removed by analyzing the Quran as a whole, and not just by quoting one particular verse. Because if one particular verse of the Quran if it's ambiguous, many a times the answer is given somewhere else in the Quran. Some people quote one source and neglect all the other sources. And the last point is, it's the duty of every Muslim, male or female, to seek the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and to act as his trustee on this world. And not to try and gain fame or to satisfy one's own ego. Islam believes in equality of men and women. Equality does not mean identicality. In Islam, the role of a man and woman, it is complementary. It is not conflicting. It is that of a partnership. It's not contradictory so as to strive for supremacy. Where women's rights in Islam is concerned, I have divided into six broad categories. The first are the spiritual rights. Second are the economical rights. Third are the social rights. Fourth are the educational rights. Fifth are the legal rights. And last are the political rights. Let's analyze the spiritual rights of women in Islam. The greatest misconception that the West has about Islam is that they think paradise in Islam is only meant for the male. It is not meant for the female. This misconception can be removed by quoting from Surah Nisa, chapter number 4, verse number 124, which says, وَمَنْ يَعْمَلْ مِنَ أَوْ أُنْسَى فَأُولَٰئِكَ يَدْخُلُونَ الْجَنَّةَ which means, if any of you 
to deeds of righteousness, whether it be male or female, and has faith, they shall surely enter paradise, and not the least injustice shall be done to them. A similar thing is, re a similar thing is repeated in Surah Nahal, chapter number 16, verse number 97, which says, if any of you perform good deeds, be it a man or a woman, and as a believer, we shall give you good life, and we should reward you for all your good works. Just because in Islam, sex is not the criteria to enter paradise, will you call such rights in Islam as modernizing or outdated? Another misconception is that which the Western media has, that the women have no soul. <clears throat> in fact, it was in the 17th century when the Council of Wise Men, when they gathered at Rome and they unanimously agreed that the woman had no soul. In Islam, man and woman have the same spiritual nature. And that was clarified by our young Kari, Brother Ashraf Mahmoudi, who recited the verse from Surah Nisa, chapter number 4, verse number 1, which says, Ya ayyuhan nasuttaku rabbakum, allazi khalakakum min nafsu wa wahidatu khalaka minha zawjaha. Which means that, O oh humankind, reverence your guardian Lord, who has created you from a single person, and created like nature his mate. A similar thing is mentioned in Surah Nahal, chapter number 16, verse number 72, which says that we have made for you companions and mates of your own nature. Again, in Surah Al-Shura, chapter number 42, verse number 11, it says, فَاتُوا سَمَوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضَ جَعْلَا لَكُمْ مِنْ أَنفُسِكُمْ أَزْوَاجَ he is the one who has created the heavens and the earth and has made for you pairs from among yourselves. Just because the spiritual nature of a man and woman is the same in Islam, will you call such rights in Islam as modernizing or outdated? The Quran clearly mentions that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has breathed somewhat of his spirit into the human beings. If you read Surah Hijal, chapter number 15, verse number 29, it says, When I have fashioned you in due proportion, and I breathe it into you something of my spirit, fully down in obeys. A similar thing is repeated in the Quran, in Surah Sajda, chapter number 32, verse number 9, which says, Summa sawahu. Summa sallahu wa nafaha fihi min ruhihi means we have fashioned you in due proportion and have breathed into you something of my spirit. Here when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala refers to as something of my spirit is breathed into the human being, it does not mean a sort of incarnation or a pantheistic form. It means that Allah has given to every human being something of his spiritual nature and the knowledge of God Almighty and coming closer towards Him. Your it refers to both Adam and Eve. May peace be upon them. Both were breathed something of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's spirits. Again we read in the Quran that Allah has appointed the human being as His vicegerent, as His trustee. And it is mentioned in Surah Isra, chapter number 17. Verse number 70, which says, وَلَقَدْ كَرَّمْنَا بَنِي آدَمَ That we have honored the children of Adam and bestowed on them special favors. Sorry. Here, yeah, all the children of Adam have been honored, male as well as female. There are some religious scriptures for example, the Bible, which puts the blame on Eve for the downfall of humanity. In fact, if you read the Quran, 
in Surah Araf, chapter number 7, verse number 19 to 27. Adam and Eve may peace be upon them, both are addressed more than a dozen of times. Both disobeyed God. Both asked for forgiveness. Both repented and both were forgiven. In the Bible, if you read Genesis chapter number 3, only evil has responsible, may peace be upon her, for the downfall of humanity. And according to the doctrine of original sin, because of Eve, may peace be upon her, the whole of humanity is born in sin. If you read the Bible in Genesis chapter number 3, verse number 16, it states that the God of the Bible it is saying, Unto the woman you shall bear in conception, and in sorrow shall you give birth, and your desire shall be of your husband, and he shall rule over you. That means pregnancy and childbirth has been said in the Bible to degrade the woman. And the labor pain is a sort of punishment. In fact, if you read the Quran, pregnancy and childbirth have uplifted the woman. If you read Surah Nisa, chapter number 4, verse number 1, it says, Respect the womb that bore you. It's mentioned in Surah Luqman, chapter number 31, verse number 14. It says, وَوَسَيَّنَّ insana." بِوَالِدَيْنِ أَحْسَانَ That we have enjoined on the human beings to be kind to the parents. In travail upon travail did the mother bore them and in years twain was the winning. A similar thing is mentioned in Surah Al-Kaf, chapter 46, verse number 15. It again repeats, وَوَسَيَّنَّ الْإِنسَانَ بِوَالِدَيْهِ أَحْسَانَ We have enjoined on the human beings to be kind to his parents, to be kind to the parents. In pain did the mother bore them, and in pain did she give them birth. Pregnancy in the Quran has uplifted the woman, not degraded her. Just because pregnancy has uplifted the woman in Islam, will you call such rights in Islam as modernizing or outdated? The only criteria for judgment in the sight of Allah is taqwa, God consciousness, or righteousness. It's mentioned in Surah Hujurat, chapter 49, verse number 13. O humankind, we have created you from a single pair of male and female, and have divided you into nations and tribes, so that you shall recognize each other, not that you despise each other. And the most honored in the sight of Allah is the one who is the most righteous. Sex, color, caste, wealth has got no criteria in Islam. The only criteria in the sight of Allah it is taqwa. Neither is sex the criteria for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to reward or to punish a person. If you read Surah Imran, chapter number 3, verse number 195, it says, I will never suffer the loss of any of you, be it male or female. You are companions unto each other. I have started my talk by quoting a verse from the Quran, from Surah Al-Azab, chapter number 33, verse number 35, it says, Inna al-Muslimina al-Muslimati, for Muslim men and Muslim women. Wal mu'minina wal mu'minati for believing men and women. Wal kainitina wal kainitati for devout men and women. Wal sadikina wal sadikati for true men and women. Wal sabirina wal sabirati for men and women who are patient and constant. Wal mutsaddikina wal mutsaddikati for men and women who give in charity. وَالْسَائِمِينَ وَالسَّائِمَاتِ For men and women who fast and deny themselves. وَالْحَافِذِينَ فُرُوجُهُمْ وَالْحَافِذَاتِ For men and women who guard their chastity. وَالْزَاكِرِينَ اللَّهَ كَثِيرًا وَالزَاكِرَاتِ For men and women who engage much in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's praise. 
and the worst anybody oh, that lahum lahum maghfiratun wa ajran adhima that for them Allah has prepared forgiveness and ample of reward this verse indicates that the spiritual duties the moral duties for the men and women in Islam are the same both have to believe both have to pray both have to fast both have to give zakat etc etc but the woman has been given certain concession in Islam if she is undergoing her menstrual period or pregnancy she does not have to fast she can keep those fasts later on when she is more healthy in fact during the menstrual period and during the postnatal period she need not pray also she has been given the concession and neither does she have to compensate it later on just because the moral duties of the men and women are equal in Islam will you call such rights in Islam as modernizing or outdated let's analyze the economical rights Islam gave economical rights to the women 1300 years before the West an adult Muslim woman can own she can dispose or disown any of her property without consulting anyone irrespective whether she's married or she's single in 1817 it was the first time in England that the West recognized the rights of the married woman where she was allowed to own or dispose any of her property without consultation I do agree that the women were given the economical rights 1300 years ago these are ancient rights but the question is are they modernizing or outdated a woman in Islam if she wishes to work she can work there is no text in the Quran or the authentic hadith which prevents or makes it prohibited for a woman to do any work as long as it is not unlawful as long as it is within the purview of the Islamic Sharia as long as she maintains her Islamic dress code but natural she cannot take up jobs which exhibit her beauty and body like for example modeling and film acting and such kind of jobs many of the profession <coughs> and jobs which are prohibited for the woman are also prohibited for the man for example serving liquor for example working in gambling dens for example doing any unethical or dishonest business all these jobs are prohibited for both men and women a true Islamic society requires women to take up professions such as doctors we do require female gynecologists we do require female nurses we do require female teachers but a woman in Islam has got no financial obligations the financial obligation is laid on the shoulders of the man in the family therefore she need not work for her livelihood but in genuine cases where there are financial crises in which both the ends don't meet she has the option of working here too no one can force her to work she works out of her own absolute free will besides the profession I mentioned she can work in the house and take up tailoring she can take up embroidery she can do pottery she can make baskets etc she's also allowed to work in factories and small scale industries in which which has been designed exclusively for the ladies she can work in places which have got separate sections gents and ladies because Islam does not agree within the mingling of the sex she can also do business 
And when it comes to doing transaction, where it involves interaction with a foreign male, with an amharam, she should do it through a father or a brother or a husband or a son. And the best example I can give you is of Bibi Khatija. May Allah be pleased with her, who was the wife of a beloved prophet, may peace be upon him. She was one of the most successful businesswomen of her times. And she did the transaction through her husband, Prophet Muhammad, may peace be upon him. A woman in Islam has been given more financial security as compared to the man. As I told you earlier, she, the financial obligation is not put on her shoulder. It is put on the shoulders of the man in the family. It's the duty of the father or the brother before she's married and the duty of the husband or the son after she's married to look after lodging, boarding, clothing and financial aspects of her. When she gets married, she is on the receiving end. She receives a gift. She receives a dawa or a marital gift, which is called as maher. As is mentioned in the Quran in Surah Nisa, chapter number 4, verse number 4, which says, وَآتُ النِّسَاءَ سَتُقَاتِهِنَّ نَحْلَ Gift to the woman in dawa, a marital gift. For a marriage to solemnize in Islam, Maher is compulsory. But unfortunately, in our Muslim society here, we just keep a nominal Maher to satisfy the Quran. Say 151 rupees, or some people give 786 rupees. And they spend lakhs and lakhs of rupees on the reception, on the decoration, on the flowers, on the lunch parties on the dinner parties. In Islam, there is, no, there is no lower limit, nor is there an upper limit for maher. But when a person can spend lakhs of rupees on the reception, surely the maher should be much more. There are various cultures which have crept into the Muslim societies, especially in the indo pak area. They give a small amount of maher and they expect the wife to get a fridge, to get a TV set, they expect the wife to give a flat, to get a car, etc. And a large sum of dowry, depending upon the status of the husband. If he's a graduate, they may, accept, they may expect one lakh. If he's an engineer, they may expect three lakhs. If he's a doctor, they may expect five lakhs. Demanding dowry. A husband demanding dowry from the wife directly or indirectly is prohibited in Islam. If the parents of the girl give the girl something out of their own free will, it's accepted. But demanding or forcing directly or indirectly is prohibited in Islam. If a woman works, which she does not have to, whatever earning she gets, it is absolutely her property. She need not spend a single pie on the household. If she wants to spend, it's her free will. Irrespective how rich the wife is, it's the duty of the husband to give lodging, boarding, clothing, and look after the financial aspects of the wife. In case of divorce, or if a wife gets widowed, she is given financial support for the period of Idda. And if she has children, she is also given child support. Islam gave the right to the woman to inherit centuries ago. If you read the Quran in several verses, in Surah Nisa, in Surah Baqarah, and in Surah Maida, it is mentioned that a woman Irrespective, she's a wife, or she's a mother, or a sister, or a daughter, she has a right to inherit. And it has been fixed by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Quran. And do know, there are bound to be questions that the inheritance law of, in, of Islam 
is unjust. But time does not permit me to clarify this. Inshallah, I will expect a question on this and then I can deal with this topic more in detail. Let's go further and analyze the social rights of a woman in Islam. <clears throat> Broadly, it can be categorized into four subheadings. Social rights given to a daughter, to a wife, to a mother, and to a sister. Coming to the social rights given in Islam to a daughter. Islam prohibits female infanticide. The killing of female children is forbidden in Islam. It's mentioned through Taqweer, chapter number 81, verse number 8 and 9. When the female child is buried alive and when she questions you, for what crime was she killed? Not only female infanticide has been prohibited, all sorts of infanticide has been prohibited in Islam whether it be a male child or a female child. It's mentioned in the Quran, in Surah Anam, chapter number 6, verse number 151, that kill not the children for want of sustenance, for it is Allah that will provide sustenance for you and for children. A similar thing is mentioned in Surah Isra, chapter number 17, verse number 31, which says, kill not the children, for want of sustenance, for it is Allah that will provide sustenance to you and your children. For killing of children is a major sin. In the pre-Islamic Arabia, whenever a female child was born, mostly she was buried alive. Alhamdulillah, after the spread of Islam, this evil practice has been discontinued. But unfortunately, it still continues in our country, India. According to a BBC report, in the program assignment, the title of which was Let Her Die, there was a British reporter by the name of Emily Buckingham who came all the way from Britain to India to give us the statistics of the female infanticide. This program was shown more than a year back on the Star TV and Alhamdulillah it's been shown every month and just a few days ago it was again detailed cast. In that program it gives the statistics that every day more than 3,000 fetuses are being aborted or being identified that they are females. If you multiply this figure by the number of days that's multiplied by 365, you get a figure of more than 1 million female fetuses are being aborted every year in our country. And there are big holdings and posters in states like Tamil Nadu and Rajasthan which says spend 500 rupees and save 5 lakh rupees. What does it mean? that spend rupees 500 on medical examinations like amnesty sentences or ultrasonography and identify that the child the mother is carrying if it's a female you can abort it and you'll save 5 lakh rupees how the couple of lakhs you spend on upbringing her and the remaining lakhs of rupees you spend on giving dowry according to the report of the government hospital of Tamil Nadu. Out of every 10 female children that are born, four are put to death. No wonder the female population in India is less than the male population. Female infanticide was continuing in our country since centuries. If you analyze the statistics of the 1901 census, for every 1,000 male, there were 972 females, according to the 1981 statistics and census. It tells you, for every 1,000 male, you had 934 females. And the latest statistics of 1991 tells you, 
that for every 1,000 males, you have 927 females. You can analyze that the female ratio is dropping every year. And since science and medicine has advanced, it has helped in this evil practice. Just because Islam tells you that you should not kill any children, whether it be male or female, will you call these rights in Islam as modernizing or outdated? Islam not only prohibits killing of infant children, it also prohibits and it rebukes you on rejoicing on the birth of a male child and you getting saddened on the news of a female child. If you read Surah Nahal, chapter number 16, verse number 58 and 59, it tells you that when news is brought to one of them of a birth of a female child, his face darkens and he's filled with inward grief. He hides himself in shame from his people because of the news he has received. Should he let her live in suffering or should he bury her in dust? Ah! What an evil choice they have. Quran not only prohibits female infanticide, it rebukes at the thought of you rejoicing at the birth of a male child and getting saddened at the birth of a female child. In Islam, a daughter should be brought up correctly. And according to a hadith in Ahmad, the Prophet may peace be upon him, he said, anyone who brings up two daughters properly, they will be like this to me on the day of judgment. Means will be very close to me on the day of judgment. And there's another hadith which says that anyone who upbrings two daughters properly and takes good care and brings them up with love and affection, they will enter paradise. In Islam, there should be no partiality in upbringing of the daughters of the son. According to a hadith of a beloved prophet, it said, that in the presence of the Prophet, once a man kissed his son and placed him on his lap but did not do the same to his daughter. The Prophet immediately objected and said that you are unjust. You should have even kissed your daughter and placed her on the other lap. Prophet Muhammad may peace be upon him. He did not only speak about justice, he also practiced it. Let's analyze the rights of a wife in Islam. All the previous civilizations, they have considered the woman to be an instrument of the devil. The Quran refers to the woman as Mahsana, that is a fortress against the devil. And if a woman who is good marries a man, she prevents him from going on the wrong path and keeps him on the Sirat al-Mustaqeen, that's the correct path. There's a hadith in which Prophet Muhammad may peace be upon him, he said that there is no monasticism in Islam. And again, according to Sahih Bukhari, volume number 7, chapter number 3, hadith number 4, it says that the Prophet ordained the young men all those who have the means to marry, they should marry, for it will help them to lower the gaze and guard the modesty. There is another hadith related by Anas, in which the Prophet said, anyone who marries completes half his deen. Once somebody asked me that, does it imply that if I marry twice, I will be completing my full deen? the person misunderstood the message of the Prophet. When the Prophet said that when you marry, you complete half your deen, it means that when you marry, 
It shields you from promiscuity. It shields you from fornication. It shields you from homosexuality, which lead to half the sin in this world. Only when you marry do you have opportunity to become a husband or a wife. Only when you marry do you have opportunity to become a father or a mother. And the duties of the mother and the father and that of a husband and wife are very important in Islam. So it makes no difference whether a man marries once, twice or thrice or four times, he yet completes only half his deen.